Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 165 for Monday, May 14th, 2018. Thanks, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that is, you know, by, for, and about working musicians. And a working musician myself, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, man? I'm doing quite good, Dave. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Mondays are always interesting days, transitioning from the, you know, weekend warrior uh, yeah. working musician into the the weekday warrior running everything else that I do. Not that it not Some, that either either really ever ends, but you know, yeah. So sometimes it's hard to make that transition, especially if you had a great weekend and you're just like you're drained of energy to go back to the real world sometimes can be a real bummer on Monday mornings. I like I like doing this show though. So it it is a nice like, you know, it's just it <laughs> a, blends a the bridge. Two, it blends the two worlds together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Did you play this weekend? I did. I played uh, with Uptown. We had a, a charity gig that we played. Uh, we were paid, uh, but it was a charity event for, um, uh, I think it was called the Crossroads House. They they raise money for uh, people that are less fortunate and, and, and that sort of thing. So it was an auction that they did. And, and then, of course, we played. And um, it was interesting. It, it was... Um, the first gig that we've had in a while with Uptown and, and that meant that it was not part of the string of get Dave up to speed. He's the new guy gigs, right? It was just, yeah. it was just like, okay, we're a band and we're going to play a gig. And we all know the routine of how things go at the gig, you know, the setup routine and like all of that stuff. Everybody's sort of like, not only am I up to speed, but like I have jobs to do and that I don't think the previous drummer had like, you know, things have sort of reorganized around this new, uh, this new lineup. And, uh, and it, and, and from that standpoint, it, it's really great. Like everybody gets along, you know, these gigs that we do aren't just like show up at the club at eight 30 and play a nine 30 downbeat or whatever. It's, you know, we get there at three in the afternoon for, for the full band is a, a 9 p.m. downbeat, but we have like different things during the during the evening where there might be cocktail music that some of us will go and play, or you know, piano music that our our keyboard player will do maybe during dinner or whatever. And so it becomes an all day affair, and we kind of have to spend the whole day together in in a variety of ways. So can I ask a question? If everybody yeah. has to be there at three. Um, so everybody's time in is the same, but right. if certain people are only playing the um, cocktail set, is compensation different for different people based upon how much performing they're actually doing? No, no, we're all there. We have to make it happen. And so it's split equally from that standpoint. Yep. And everybody's cool with it. And, you know, I mean, like I didn't participate in the cocktail music as much this time because we were worried about uh, space and volume, but as it turns out, actually I could have, and I did, I wound up, I kind of wound up going over there and, and, um, really being there to heckle the guys, um, Gary and I went over to heckle and then they, they were like, Oh, come on over and sing a song. I was like, yeah, okay, great. No problem. <laughs> so I sang, uh, you can't do that with them. And you know, it was, I mean, it was just fun. And, and that's cocktail hour can often be the, the most enjoyable part of the gig because for the most part, it's musicians playing for each other, you know, wallpaper for everybody else. And um, so as long as you keep the volume constrained and all that stuff, yeah, it's I hear you. kind of fun. Yeah. It turns into like, you know, an acoustic gig and then an electric gig kind of right afterwards. So with the same people, some of the same people. So, yeah. yeah. We um, it's interesting. We have, you know, all my horn players are jazz players. And so when we get asked to do a jazz that they actually really enjoy that. Um, and our bass player, you know, plays jazz real well. Nick, um, it's not his natural style. So he has to kind of work double hard and, you know, actually it's, it's stressful for him, but for the horn players, they really enjoy that. That, like you said, it's kind of musician for musician yeah. and their opportunity to do play us, you know, style of music, uh, you know, that they really, really love. And so sure. it's kind of cool, you know, the jazz standards things. I mean, I think it's funny because, you know, we probably play, 10 to 15 jazz standards is all we've had in our book, you know, for ever. ever right? Yeah, right. We don't really spend any time on it. So it really is stuff that the guys just know. Sure. And so, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Like Saturday wasn't it it probably should have been more jazz standards, but it it wasn't. Like from the other room I heard those guys playing like fastball and and Steely Dan and stuff. It was like just kind of like well that's what that's what like our sax player said, "Listen, we don't kill ourselves over this stuff. You can do brown-eyed girl absolutely. as a as an instrumental and let the, you know, let the sax play the play the melody and and you've got another cocktail hour song. And you can do that with several songs and yeah. you know, certainly almost every Beatles song you can do that with." Yeah. So uh, you and know, we were, we were doing it, or they, and then, and then, and then we were doing it with vocals too. So I mean, it was it was just like an acoustic rock set is really what it yeah. what it became, which That's is cool. fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was interesting. You know, there's an assumption in this band now because no one thinks of me as the new guy. Like I don't really even think of me as the new guy, uh, except for when we're in the middle of a song that we've never played together before, and it's like, hey, so who's going to cue me as to when I should end this song? You know, like, cause the drummer is the one in most cases, right? The drummer's the one who plays the ending. If the drummer stops, the song's over. If, uh, if the drummer keeps playing, <laughs> the song hasn't ended. Right. I mean, it, like for dance music, that's, that's generally true. Uh, so it's this weird thing of I'm the one in charge, but I don't really know what everybody else thinks is going to happen. And, and there's, there's two separate, you know, consensus is going on here and I would like it to be one. So, so communication gets interesting and, and the stage setup was, was weird. It was a very shallow stage. It was, I think eight feet deep. Uh, I think it was two, four foot panels deep and, and it might've even been just six. No, it would have been eight feet deep, but we, uh, but we put a curtain up at the back of the stage to like store some cases and stuff out of sight. And uh, you guys have your own curtain and, and uh, pipe and drape. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It pays. It totally pays off because otherwise you wind up having to store things, you know, <laughs> possibly like all the way down in the van or whatever. And that's not good at the end of the evening. So, yeah. So we put the pipe and drape up. And um, so this stage was was because of that. But just because of the way the stage was, it was really shallow and and wide. So. I was in the, I, they had me, I tried to be uh, fully stage left facing sideways, which I find really works well on, on stages like that. But um, our guitar player, who's the leader of the band is like, no, I think that looks weird. So set up in the middle. It's like, okay. But that meant our two vocalists, we have, uh, you know, Marty and, and Kelly. And so, you know, we kind of do the male female thing and they usually play like stand next to each other and play off. I had one of them on one side of me and one on the other. And and then people were, you know, very much it was a it was kind of a very linear thing where where there was no depth to it. Everybody just had their own thing. And so it was kind of weird communicating, especially, you know, if our guitar player who sort of runs the sets, uh, if he wanted to call an audible, you know, before a song ended for the next one, it was like right. the, the communicating things around was very, very difficult. Um, so it was just weird, but you know, I mean, you, you sort these things out and the gig went, like, actually the gig went really, really well. I mean, everybody's a pro. That's cool. Everybody has fun and you know, it really was, it was a blast, but it's always, so weird. I got a couple of questions for yeah, you. Yeah, so, um, you've been with Uptown, Uptown Celebration, Celebration yep. for a year now. Mm -hmm. And um, how many songs do you have? Oh, if I had to put it all together, there's probably, um, there might be a hundred songs on their list, but, but 80 in the kind of in the, the rotation. But I mean, there's, you know, there's the hits that are played every gig and then we kind of move things around depending. Got it. So, and yeah. this is actually my question. So, sure. uh, so Russ has been with us, you know, pretty much since December, right. January. Right. And same thing. We have about a hundred total songs. Well, actually we've revived a hundred songs with Russ. Sure. Of which 80, you know, are kind of our ace, a list you know, to choose from in any gig of which, you know, 30 are every gig. Right. right. Yep. Okay. So, so, so but the question is, yeah, it's very similar. So probably, probably a lot of uh, the same songs too. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, so, but what's of interest is we rehearse once a week and for the first, so January, February, March and April, you know, we miss, we've missed maybe four out of the, out of the, you know, four months, four and a half months we've been going. Right. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, we're pretty diligent about it. We work hard and uh, Russ was given X amount of songs 
to bring back, you know, that I would give him to go back and learn that we already know. Um, at one point in time, it got to be too much. He said, I need to put a little bit of break on this because I want the stuff I know to be good. You know, not, I don't want to just be passingly know it. I want to make sure we're good at this, which is a smart thing to do. He said, you yep. know, time out. Yep. Let's make sure we are in between that. We have, you know, in the winter time, we're playing maybe three, four gigs a month. Um, you get a chance to, you know, that's another chance to get a play in on those songs. But my point is, is that, and I realized this, this past gig that we had on Saturday night is the 30 that are in solid rotation are good. The 10 that we've added this year that the whole band learned new so far this year, we're all on the same page. We're all good. Sure. The stuff that I've had him learn that he's not getting excessive plays on and he doesn't, because we're not playing 10 times a month. That's the stuff that he knows and he's got a chart for. He, he desires to be off chart, which is really commendable. Um, uh, but do you have this is what I'm saying. Like of those 80 to a hundred, are there 20, 30, 40 that are in the, yeah, we played them, we rehearsed them, but we haven't really put a lot of work into them. Um, you know, if you're going to call it, what would you say? Just give me time, give me the set list a week in advance. So if there's anything I need to brush up, how are you dealing with the songs that are technically they're on your list and you, you play, but in practicality, you haven't gotten a lot of reps on in the time you've been with this band. So that's true of every song with this band. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> there, well, because the band doesn't rehearse much, if at all. I mean, I, I, maybe we've had five rehearsals. Um, and, and so, and, and the band, this band doesn't play all that frequently either. Right. You know, so there's, and, and so I'm not the only one that's sort of in this boat. Our bass player is the second newest guy, but I think he's been in the band for years. Um, but he's reading charts on stage for sure. You know, um, but, but I think he knows the endings maybe more than me. I don't know. Um, but that, that's where things get, get weird is, is like, you know, those uh, odd transition or, or endings. And those are the notes that I make for myself on stage. So yeah, when something is called like Gary will, will send out a set list and generally it's, you know, here's what set one will be. If we play all of set one, here's what set two will be. If we play all of set two, and then here's the songs that we've got in our back pocket. And generally speaking on the gig, he won't call anything other than things from that list. So I put them all into four score, uh, uh, you know, on stage and, um, on my iPad and I can pretty easily call up any of those, uh, almost with like two taps, you know? So, and, and, yep. and these songs, like, it, it's not like I have no idea how these songs go. The, the, the charts that I would pull up, and for most songs, actually, on Saturday, even I didn't have to pull up charts like I, I remember. Oh, yeah, this is how they end superstition. You know, this is how this tune ends. This is how this one starts. That's different from, you know, sort of the general consensus amongst all cover bands, you know. And uh, it, but there's some where it's like, oh, yeah, like they, they do this interesting arrangement of Walking on Sunshine, which we've never rehearsed together. We've I believe we've now played it once. We may have played it twice, but I hunted it down and found a video of them playing it with their old drummer and and heard this ending. And it was like, oh, well, yeah, this like they should have said we should rehearse this. Like, there's no way I would have guessed my way through this. So I yeah. charted out what I saw in this video and and I was reading that chart, I think, for the first time the other night as we were pulling it together. And, and it's fine. So, so those types of things are the reason that I would pull up the chart. And, um, you know, I have my iPad, I've got it on, uh, I, I still use an iPad mini, which is a great size. And it's sad that Apple doesn't make it anymore, but, um, I have it on, on one of these little scorpion clamps things that, that sits right on my, um, on my hi hat stand. So it's just to the left of my, my left knee. And so it's totally out of the way. And it, like, I mean, I'm sure people can see that I have it, but it's not, you know, it's not like on a music stand or anything where it's, you know, up on the stage or anything. So I can, I can live with that. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers so I'll tell your question. You, yeah. Well, it sort of answers my question is that, yeah. you know, there's an element of, you know, no, it's not, everything is not a hundred percent prepared. So I'd say this as a, as a leader, I know that, right. Yep. Um, I, I know it and I know that there's stuff we haven't played for a while, Sure. but what I've tried to create is a, an environment, a culture in the band where 
he could call anything at any time. So that's just part of the expectation. Um, I do um, as often as I can put the set list out and, and note to the guys songs that are coming back and, you know, expect them to woodshed it. I also, as a leader, I know what my guys are capable of. So there are guys in my band who get very, very butt tight when things are not absolutely perfect. Sure. Uh, And I actually, you know, feel it's within my domain as the leader to be like, well, you know what, this song would, would serve a great purpose right now, whether it's a request or, you know, a a moment that, uh, you know, a song that fits a moment. And I know what my guys are capable of. And I will knowingly call something knowing it's not going to be spot dead perfect, but I know my guys can get it close enough. I won't call something that's going to expose someone, you know, and make them look bad. I won't do that. Sure. Of course. That's because, yeah. What's what purpose does that serve? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but, but that is it. You know, I, I very consciously like will throw in one of the old songs just to get a play in it every once in a while and to keep people thinking and to keep the band on its toes. Mm -hmm. Do you like that? Or do you? I love that. And I I think that's why it sort of worked for me to drop into the band that I'm in with Uptown because they, they know that I'm fine with that. I mean, there's, I don't think they knew we hadn't played walking on sunshine before, but there are definitely songs that Gary has called and and that he knows I've never played with them before, you know, and he'll tell me usually tell me, you know, at the beginning of the game, Hey, I might call this tune, you know, and I'm like, okay, that's fine. And I've, I've had him, you know, just like come over and stand next to me and be like, all right, you know, chorus, like, okay, cool. You know, fine. It's it's great. But I like that in the moment kind of stuff that, that, that frankly, that's why it's worth packing up my drums and, you know, going out and spending the afternoon, Sure, you know, to, if I was just playing the same exact thing and it was perfect, uh, that would, that would be fun once, but after that, not so much for me. So, well, interesting. So, yeah. you know, actually the inner monologue that I have about this is it moves over time, moves back and forth, really mm-hmm. swings back and forth because the 30 really good songs we have kill. And it dawns on me sometimes, you know, we've got them. We put in the work. Let's let's just play that for a while and we will go over guaranteed absolutely every time. Yep. And then, you know, well, you know, we're playing a stretch of gigs where people may come and see us multiple times in a week. Uh, you know, let's give them something different. And so then the pendulum swings back and then we go reach into things. So, you know, I, I kind of like, you know, there's there's 10,000 variables that go into any of these decisions. But, you know. If it's a gig where I definitely want to like a booker, I want to absolutely floor. I'll play. I, and I don't want to say it's the safe show because it's not so much that it's safe. It's just because they're great songs and they work. So right. maybe I'll, maybe I'll make that call. If it's a, again a stretch of gigs where I think people are coming to see us a few times um, or have traveled to see us, I want to give them something. Even if it's a minority of the audience, I want to give them something a little yeah, bit different every throw day. Something, throw something different out. No, I, I yeah. totally, I, I, I absolutely subscribe to that. Uptown's a little different because chances are there's no one at tonight's right. private gig was at the last gig. Right. They're all private gigs. The only time you'd get, you know, repeat patrons is, is if like literally the same group hires you for their corporate party again next year. But they hired you for that thing. Though, but that's right? the thing. I mean, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a year. Like if you delivered literally the exact same thing, they'd probably be really happy about that. Right? Exactly. So, so it's a little different, but yeah, like with, with fling, I absolutely like to mix it up uh, night to night and uh, and even week to week where, you know, things are things are different and, and you give people a reason, the same person, a reason to to, you know, it like it's managing FOMO, right, is y- you want people to have that fear of missing out. And yep. where, you know, oh, you played that last night. You, you didn't play that last week. That's like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But there's. Uh, from again, from the leader standpoint, there's this very subtle tension between uh, wanting the band to kill yep. and get the business and get the repeat business. And then there is, you know, like I am sensitive to it, but where it is on my sensitivity scale moves, depending on, again, the thousand variables, how much I want to keep my musicians, my band yep. focused and engaged. Like some, you know, and we might go a week of gigs where, you know, Every I know I know two or three guys are really busy with day job stuff, and if I throw an old song, they're not going to have a chance to get it. And so we may pay a week of 
of gigs or a weekend of gigs of the same, mostly the same. I'm probably never play the exact same set list. We'll move stuff around, but, sure. but, but the same songs, cause I know that they're going to be done. And, you know, there is some comfort in the, in the, um, assurity that, you know, that the, the, these songs in this set, you know, will go over. So there, the line moves, you know, there's sometimes I want to keep the musicians on their toes and thinking, but it's not a game that I'm playing. It's not, it's not, I'm, it's not jeopardy. I'm not trying to catch them not knowing stuff. I want everyone to be in a, in a position to win, but within that, there's a bunch of things. There's like, again, knowing what my band is capable of knowing the vibe of the band or, you know, are people tense about something and, you know, should we play it safe tonight or are people tense about something? Let's get them out of their comfort zone. And, you know, maybe something magical had happened. So these are kind of all the kind yeah. of the things that are going through my mind, a, when making a set, B when running a show, you know, C staying in tune with, with the vibe of the band on stage at any one point in time. You know, we had an interesting thing on Saturday night <laughs> where, um, we had a good show. Um, we haven't played a ton in the past month. Um, and I did bring back a couple of old songs that by and large went really, really well. Um, and by the end, the band killed and it was a good crowd and a good energy and, you know, everything was feeling good. And then this was that club where we play uh, 730 to 1030. We played eight to 1030 this this time. But um, and then the DJ kicks in and then the younger crowd starts to come in. Something was wrong at the DJ station and he couldn't get hooked up. Uh -oh. So we just kept going. We played about an extra half hour, which was really fun. Um, and you know, we were just kind of picking stuff and I was just calling it and we were just kind of going because every song I didn't know if he was going to be ready at the end of at the end of the next song. So we're sure. trying to figure out, you know, where he was. So we got an extra half hour play out of it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but again, it was that, you know, there was good vibe in the room. There was some, you know, like a wedding party walked in after their wedding that day, she was still in her wedding dress and they were there to get a little bit of more celebration out of the day, which was really fun. That's great. We did a song for them. And so, you know, it, that, I think that's part of the art and science of it is, is managing to the moment. Oh, absolutely. Well, and that, I mean, that's what, even at our uptown gigs, like the other night, it was it was a uh, decidedly older crowd, not not 90s, but but certainly trending, you know, 50s and, and 60s and, and upwards. So it was like, you know, when we were talking about it before we went on stage, cause we're like, well, you know, do we come out of the gate swinging or what? And and their party ended at 11, like the venue has a hard curfew for that. And we were supposed to start at nine. And of course, you know, their dinner and everything runs late. So 920 maybe is when we finally hit the stage. So I was like, well, we're only doing one set. We're not taking a break, obviously, you know, and these people are going to start scattering like they've been here a long time. They've had dinner. They've had drinks, you know, like I don't we don't think we so we got to we got to set the hook. So we did. We came out swinging and, and it was good. There were people up. And then it started to thin. It was like, OK, let's, you know, shift. Let's do our fly me to the moon and, and you know, moon dance and things like that, where it's a little more mellow. And and then it was like, OK, those people started to head out and the only people that were left are the party animals. So it's like, OK, great. Now we can ramp things back up and rev it up and, and you know, sail through to the end. So um, so but you, but yeah, I mean, you have to be able to you, and it, it not only do you have to, I think, have to do that. You also have to have one person on stage who is in charge of that. Um, and, and you just need to, you know, implicitly trust. And even if you don't trust, it doesn't matter. You have to follow that person. Like there can't be any debate or anything. It's like if that person thinks that fly me to the moon is the next, the right next song. It's like, okay, well let's, you know, one, two, <laughs> that's it. You just play the song. And, and again, I'll and tell you, go. the funny thing is in, in my band, my horns are just used to being sidemen. Right? right. They typically don't voice an opinion about about set list. They say, you know, tell me what to play and I'll play it down. And, sure. and, and but but my rhythm section, you know, tends it, people have different levels of more opinions about what should happen on stage. And of sometimes course. is sometimes there's a clash and, you know, there should never be a clash. So. So well, uh, I, I you're right. It's there fine. Need, there needs it's to fine be, for there to be a clash or, or even just a healthy discussion before you walk on stage so that before you walk on stage, wh whoever is managing the evening has that in their head, right? Like, okay, you know, like, well, you know, uh, Dave doesn't know fly me to the moon. So maybe I shouldn't, uh, maybe I need to be aware of that before I call. I mean, I do know it, but you know, like those types of things, but also maybe it's Marty doesn't want to sing moon dance tonight. So I really only should call that if, 
it's the right song, like absolutely the right song. And I got to cross that sure. line or, you know, whatever. But once it, once you get on stage, that person, whoever that is, just needs to be the one driving the bus, especially for a party type scenario. Right. You know, like there can be, there can be times where maybe a, a band huddle is a, is okay. I wouldn't say it's a good idea, but it, it acceptable, but never, in like a thing like we're doing with Uptown where you're playing a party like that. No, 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 that 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 happens ahead of time or never, you know. Well, I, I'll give you the, uh, another angle to this. So sure. we, I've had a situation where um, someone in my band has got us a private party for someone like an association or organization that they work with. Sure. Right. Yeah. And um, they were like, hey, I know these guys are going to want some some specific things. Um, can I call the show? And I was like, all right, let's try it. Right. Um it it became rapidly apparent that handing that baton over does not hand the competency over. There were lots of long pauses while someone was thinking about what the next song should be. And, sure. you know, so the skill of keeping the flow of your show going is a thing. It is a thing. And, uh, and you need and, to learn it. It's not. It, or you need to you need to look in the mirror and, and understand if you don't have it and don't ask for it. Right. Well, that, too. But you can also like anybody out there that's that's in this position. There are things that you can do to hedge your bets. Like for me, I, I've certainly called shows with no set list. Right. And and just like one song to the next. It's just like, let make it up as I go along. And that's fun. And when the flow is happening, that that's great. But when the flow is not happening, it can be like pulling teeth, right? It's like, oh, crap, what's next? Oh, it's on me, right? Okay, I got to figure it out. So for that reason, when I know that I have to call a show, I build a set list. And I might spend an hour, you know, meticulously, like, trying different songs, just on paper, trying different songs back and forth. Oh, okay, this would be good. This would be good. Yep. Save enough good songs for each set so that you're not, you know, robbing from yourself later and leaving yourself with nothing at the end or, or whatever. Right. So I will do that and I will show up at the gig with the set list printed and all that stuff. And we put them down on stage. And then if the flow's going, we may not ever once pay attention to that set list, but yeah. I'm paying attention to it. Right. Either literally looking at it on the ground, you know, as I've sort of spread it out next to me or in my head, because, the you know, that morning or the day before I went through and did this. So I have uh, like I'm prepared to deal with this. And if I can't figure out what to do next, I've already decided what to do next. It's on the list. Right. So it's really easy to just think, okay, you know what? The next three songs are these three. Great. Okay, cool. We can settle. Great. Ah, inspiration strikes. Great. We'll take a left turn and go here. All good. So yep. I mean, to me, that's, and I, I, I think that would be a good thing for anyone to do, right? Is if you're if you're going to be in this position, prepare yourself so that, yeah, you might have had an experience. We all have or at least the lucky ones where you call a show off the cuff, the entire thing, two hours straight. And it's freaking amazing. Don't let that lull you into believing that you will be able to do that all the time because you're it's not always going to happen so you got to be prepared to to have something to fall back on i think i agree yeah absolutely yeah i'm with you so i got an interesting thing to bring up to you i want to talk a little bit about the value of complexity <laughs> okay so we've started on a song that is um and we actually we've done this in the past you know songs come in suggestions for songs and they're a little out for whatever reason. The one we had last year was a little outside of our, our the model that we had. It was it was um, it was a George Michael song, and um, there was a sense among some of the band that you know we, we don't have that type of background vocals. You know we're not gonna we can't just take the we're gonna make it sound like us approach to this. This will fall flat if right. we go. Well, it will sound right? us will sound bad doing that. Right. Yeah. It, so that was the approach. Uh, sure. You know, feeling of some others like you know, let's let's have a can do attitude. And then I'm reflecting on it because this year we've just jumped into another song. So this we just jumped into a song. Stevie Wonder's "Do I Do." Yeah, that's a that's a fun one. You've played it before. I played it with uh, with Ghetto Fabulous, yeah, ten years ago. Or so, yep. 
So the changes are, you know, definitely not rock changes. There's like some straight up, you know, jazz sections of it. There's, you know, really tight syncopation on this you know, kind of mm-hmm. signature line on it. I mean, it, it is a thing. It's going to take us a while. Fortunately, you know, again, the things that that we as a band have to spend the most time on usually is harmonies. Um, uh, but this one is there's no harmonies, but, the, you know, the instrumentation is and it's going to take a long time now. So my question is this. Do you, do you recall ever being in a situation where uh, the introduction of, of complex of complexity while the musicians may get off on on conquering the beast? Yep. You know, maybe it doesn't go over as well when you play it. And then you're like, well, what do we put all the time into it for? Yeah. Or you play it fine, but it just does, doesn't end up being what you envisioned it you know, what the band envisioned it when you brought it. So just, I wanted to ask you how to, how have you encountered this? Do leaders, you know, keep people on the same page? You know, if it's, you know, four or five rehearsals to get a song, right. Um, you know, you've now invested a lot of time. Uh, you could have knocked out three or four easier songs, maybe in that, in that period of time, but you've chosen to take this path and you want to pay off for your effort in and, um, how satisfying is it? when when the payoff comes how demoralizing is it when the payoff doesn't come or how demoralizing is it when not enough of a payoff comes like you know you get the musicians in the crowd going whoa that's cool you did that but by and large it's not killing for the amount of time that you've put in 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 the cover band world where people are you know i i'd like to think 80 percent of the people you're just imparting a vibe that's wafting over the event, whether it's the dance floor, the club or whatever it is. And 20 percent of the people are musicians or appreciate music to the degree where they're listening close enough. What is the value of the payoff of complexity? Yeah, that's true, because it'd be very different if we were talking about like the tribute band world, right, where people are coming to hear you play songs. That's what by you promised. That, but yeah, that's what you promised. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there, I mean, there are certainly those songs that that you know. I like your term "vanity songs," right? That that you, I think you introduced to the show when we yeah. started it. You know, and, but sometimes there are vanity songs, and and by vanity song, for those of you that haven't heard us mention this before, that's the song that you do because you want to do it, um, and you do it for yourself. But there are some songs that are vanity songs that also happen to be songs that, if done moderately well will entertain a crowd. And so you can kind of check both boxes. Right. And that, I think do I do is that because, you know, it's a be. beautiful song yeah, and, and right. it's a great dance song. It's got a great vibe to it. It's great. You know, wonderful feel. Our drummer plays the heck out of it. I mean, there's a lot of good things going on there. It's it, for us. That song is going to be about the changes and the tightness of it because you can't yes. hack your way through a song like that. Well, and that's the thing is, is like when, when those two worlds collide, the, the song that's good for the crowd and then also the vanity song, there's a risk there though, because you can convince yourself that it's worth spending five rehearsals to get this right. Because we know that like the chances of us playing this regularly are much higher than if we picked something obscure that, that, you know, maybe we're the only ones that know. Uh, so, but but this the the bar to hit is still there where like you said you've got to get it right you you got to get it close enough and unfortunately with vanity songs that bar is higher right even if it's a vanity song that that crowds are going to like crowds aren't it, above a certain level and that level's pretty low crowds aren't going to care right whether you hit that syncopation perfectly or or you know nailed that transition to the the different uh feel perfectly or any of that but you're going to care and so you can wind up in a scenario where the song goes over just fine but you as the band or several members of the band are just unhappy about it and that's when it's like well I've put in cuz I've been in this scenario where it's you know you put in whatever six rehearsals for something and then one person comes out from the next gig and says, okay, yeah. yeah. Like one band member comes out from the next gig where you play it. Like, yeah, we need to tweak this and we need to tweak that. And we need to do this and we need to do that. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Like this song is, is good enough, right? Perfect is the enemy of good. And then you'll wind up spending three more rehearsals on it just to, you know, attempt to achieve whatever level of per- perfection is there. So, like that's where I've seen vanity songs like those sort of the, the special vanity songs um, 
wind up being not worth it, even though they go over perfectly fine. Um, and it, you know, it's just like, I've, I've always said that there is, there's nothing wrong with going on stage and playing or even or a rehearsal room. It doesn't matter. Right. And just playing songs that you love for the sake of playing them. Right. And then there's also nothing wrong with spending time perfecting what you're going to go out and play on stage. Like you can be a hack band or a, a, a well-oiled machine. Right. And, and anywhere in between also, I find it important that band members are neighbors on that continuum, right? You don't have to be <laughs> in exactly the same spot, but you can't have, you know, one guy in the ghetto and one guy live in the high life and expect them like that band's not going to work. You know, if one person doesn't care and one person cares a ton, it, well, it doesn't matter if one person, whatever the lowest common denominator is, is where the band's going to be. Right. Because that person isn't generally going to step up and add more perfection to their particular game. Uh, right. And and that and so but that can happen. I mean, in a in a in a band setting, like an overall band setting, the, like you need to get that straight. Uh, but even once you are all neighbors, it can happen on a song by song basis and get to be a really difficult thing. Um, and sometimes you just need to punt on the song like that. That's usually my my feeling on on, on a scenario like that is, is like you're saying, like if 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 the band, either one person or even everybody in the band is just not going to ever be satisfied or it's going to take too much work for the band to be satisfied, um, then, you know, you move on unless unless you truly are all have enough time and, and are willing to say, yeah, you know what, let's spend the next month rehearsing this one song and let's get it. Let's nail it. Let's, let's do this yeah. for, for ourselves. And that, but that's the conversation that needs to happen is the, is it for the crowd or for yourself? And because there's two different, two different levels that it needs to be at for that. I think. Have you ever been on the other end of that though, where like you're, you're, a vanity song is brought in or, or let's just call it a complex song is brought sure. in. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't speak up in the beginning of the process. And all of a sudden you're up to your waist and, you know, five, six hours of, of rehearsal into it. And you're questioning where it's going. Have you ever put the brakes on, let, you know, guys, we're, this isn't going the way we want it to go. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've also been on, I've been on both sides. Can you remember that. what song? I'm trying to think there, there were some, there were some tunes in, Huh. Yeah. In, in the Murray Woods band, we, um, we started messing around with, uh, oh gosh, I'll have to bring it up. It was a, a sting tune. Um, sting spring on the night record was a, just a great record. And we all really loved it. And that, that should have been our first sign, right? That, Oh, not so good. Um, but, uh, but we started playing this song and we rehearsed it and we got it close it, you know, but, uh, it, it, it never really got there. And, um, we tried it live. I'm trying to think of what song it was. I'll, I'll bring it up here. Uh, Oh, driven to tears. So we were playing it like Sting did with his, with his, you know, dream of the blue turtles band mm. on that bring on, bring on the night thing. And, and it was like, it was crowds loved it. And we did not. Because, mm. you know, we were all listening to Well, the to bar it. is very high with you know, trying to imitate that band. That band. That was the problem is, is like we were musicians and we're good musicians in that band. But still, like those those guys play at a different level. Right. Yeah. You, you know, and so it, we, it, we never felt like we got there. And it was finally it was like, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. We just got to punt on this. That's it's not. And and I don't know that I was the first one to to say we need to put the brakes on, but. It, it, I, I was I was certainly on board with that concept. I, I, we all pretty much we were like, yeah, this is just not going to work. And people would come to the gigs and ask, oh, can you play Driven to Tears? Like, yeah, no, <laughs> we don't. We don't know that song. Uh, <laughs> In and what, how about the other side? We don't know the song. So how about the other side? A, a song that you fought for despite group consensus. It might not be the right way to go. Oh, well, I mean, that was sort of the start of my career playing in bands, right? Because I came out of the prog rock world, right? So I, I grew up listening, especially as I started, you know, Dave, the young drummer, it's immediately started listening to, you know, Rush and Yes and ELP and all that stuff. And I tried for a long time to, to find bands that would want to play that kind of stuff live and realized, yeah, you know, the, the audience for that 
it does it. I mean, it exists if you're if you're Rush or Yes or ELP, but it doesn't really exist in the cover band, you know, scenario, especially not when I was in high school and 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 that sort of thing. So I just I had to I I, I just got used to that very, very quickly. Like, OK, well, you know, some of these songs are just too complex to do with most bands. And every now and then, you know, I'll stumble onto a group of musicians and we'll be playing. And somebody will say, oh, you know, somebody will play like the lick from Free Will or something. And it'll be like, oh, we all know that. Yeah, that's fine. Let's play it, you know, and then we can work on it. And it's like, oh, what a what a treat to find other musicians that have put in because it to to go and play a song like like Free Will, you know, uh, rushes uh, on their permanent wave al- permanent waves album. It, it's a really difficult song. Like you're not just going to pick that up by listening to it like you would say Sweet Home Alabama. And I'd say that knowing that Sweet Home Alabama is way more complex than any cover band ever plays it. But, mm-hmm. but you know, you can get the vibe of that tune and play it and sing it and crowds will love it. You, you go try to do that with free will. It just doesn't work. You, you, there, like there are syncopated things and unison things and, you know, very specific changes and all that stuff. You need to go spend several hours, maybe dozens of hours individually figuring out your parts. And then and only then can you come together and actually make the song work. And I say that because I've done it. But, it, you know, everyone in the in the band at that point had spent, you know, years of their childhood like I had learning that tune and others, of course. So it was like, OK, yeah, we have the knowledge to play this and now we can talk about it together with this common, you know, framework that that means something. Whereas, you know, if you were just trying to play it off the cuff, it, it would be a disaster, no matter how good you are. Right. You, I mean, you just you need to know the song and you need to know how these parts work and how to make your hands do the things that they need to do so that you can be a participant in this process. So, yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've been on both sides of it. Yeah. My bass player, Steve, who is brilliant and funny and an incredible musician, he had one of the most useful um, sayings for for dealing with not just complexity. It's not just that. Sometimes it's just refinement, getting something perfect, you know, doing stuff that's different than what, like you said, the hack bands. And again, there's nothing wrong with being a hack band if everybody's on the same page. If that's what you want to be. It, yeah. If you that's what you want to be. People Whatever makes it. you happy, right? right. Yeah. But um, what, when we work on either a song that requires a lot more effort or, you know, the kind of song, you know, that, that requires – a different approach. He said, <laughs> he calls it eating at the grown up table. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Right. Like you, you need to have, have done something previously on your own, uh, that, that, that gets you a seat there. Absolutely. It gets yeah. you a seat. Exactly. Yeah. And then you can, conti- and then you need to continue to deliver to stay at the grown ups table too. It's not like yes. you earn a seat and it's yours for life. No, without a doubt. <laughs> I like that a seat at the grown ups table. He's awesome. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's pretty good, man. Oh man. Huh? Hey, see here. I thought the title of the episode was going to be sweet home, Alabama versus free will, right? Like <laughs> I, I thought that was it. And then eating at the grown up table, eating at the grown up table. <laughs> and it's like, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I like it. All right. Good, man. Fun stuff. Fun stuff. Yeah. 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 Very, very good. Very good. We were yeah. kind of cerebral today. That's okay. That's okay. We, um, I guess it was, it was, we were in sync on this. So that's good. Yeah, we, go. both, we were we neighbors. Both ate at those, we were neighbors. <laughs> neighbors on the continuum. That's it. Man. <laughs> cool. Uh, you got anything else or are we good to go, man? I'm good, man. Thanks for everything today. Thank you too, folks. Thanks for listening. Uh, this has been an absolute blast. Really uh, find us. GigGabPodcast.com is sort of the home. You can find us on Facebook from there at GigGabPodcast.com slash Facebook. You can send us email feedback at GigGabPodcast.com. We would love to hear from you, either comments on Facebook or email or both, whatever it takes. What do we like to say, my friend? Always be performing. See you next week. Late.